Hi, welcome to Connect and Collaborate. My name is Alex Hopkins, taking over for Tammy Schaefer, your regular on-air producer. And this week we are talking legislative uh, session that, that took place January 10th that opened up. And all week we are talking with some legislators, you know, we're talking Senate, we're talking House, and, uh, you know, my, my political expertise is it's not great. So I've got <laughs> Jeff Walston here to fill these questions. Uh, but right now we have Jeff Hayes with us, who is the Republican State Party Chair. So uh, let's jump right in. Jeff Walston, how are you today? Excellent. It's great to be well, here. Well, thank you. Uh, Jeff, it's so great to have you on air, and it's great to chat with you. Uh, in addition to having, on obviously, leadership from the House and Senate, uh, R's and D's, we wanted to get you as uh, the Republican State Party Chair here in Colorado and, and your counterpart, Morgan Carroll, to also talk a little bit about the national landscape, uh, what's important to you here in Colorado, what the party's working on, the priorities, and give you a chance to really say and share your vision moving forward. But you know, before we jump in, um, for those of you that, that that are listening that may not know Jeff, Jeff, we want to really give you a chance to chat a little bit about your background uh, and then really explain why in the heck you decided to run for maybe one of the most thankless jobs out, <laughs> outside of being a legislator. Uh, so jump in. Well, thank you very much, Jeff. And I can already see this is going to be a problem. We've got too many Jeff on the call. Yeah. Uh, That's a good thing. Why? <laughs> No, you know, I was uh, I was raised on the Gulf Coast of Texas. My parents were both school teachers. My dad was a football coach. And most people that know me now know that I can't speak for five minutes without using some kind of football analogy. It's part of my genetics, part of my upbringing. And um, I went to the Air Force Academy. I, I did play football at the Air Force Academy, the biology major, and started my Air Force career uh, on a good note. My wife and I got married right after graduation. So we've been married about 35 years. And uh, we have three, you know, grown daughters, beautiful daughters, and the, uh, my oldest just gave us our second grandbaby this week. So we're fired up about that. Uh, congratulations. But I spent, well, thank you. It, I tell you what, it really is as all they say. You know, grandchildren are definitely worth the, uh, <laughs> the trials and tribulations of having children. <laughs> but I was in the acquisition part of the Air Force for a while, <clears throat> had an opportunity to go get a master's degree in biology, come back to the academy, and teach. And then I really was committed to the Air Force, but I wanted to do something positive with this new degree that I had, and I uh, decided to become an aerospace physiologist. And so I was at Beale Air Force Base working with a high-altitude reconnaissance program, U-2, uh, space suits, all this really cool stuff. And Fisher DeBerry called me up and asked me if I wanted to come back and coach the kickers. If any of you know Coach DeBerry, he spoke uh, with quite the southern accent. And so, um, I did that. I was a recruiting coordinator for the last seven years of my Air Force career. I retired, uh, became an athletic director at a local charter school where my wife still teaches, and also got the opportunity to work with Jason Elam and the Broncos kickers for a couple of years. And that really was a blast. Um, then I uh, got hired by a management consulting firm, so done a lot of risk analysis and business analysis, um, scheduling, you know, planning and things like that. But in the 2009 lead up to the 2010 elections, I knew that I wanted to get involved. You know, I'd been a good Hatch Act employee as an Air Force officer and, uh, you know, was not overtly involved in partisan politics. But I went down to the El Paso County headquarters, started making phone calls met my local legislator. I didn't even know who she was. And um, one thing led to another. We were at a town hall when she uh, was there, and she texted me from stage and asked if I wanted to be her House District 20 rep um, chairman, or vice chairman, excuse me. And I said, sure, what's that? <clears throat> and so I had no idea what I was getting into. And I got involved in the party apparatus, found that I enjoyed that infrastructure development, you know, keeping the trains running on time aspect of it. I thought it suited me well. And so when my predecessor in El Paso County, Eli Bremer, decided he wasn't going to run again, I decided to run and uh, had a pretty hard-fought contest against our House District 15 now, the representative, David Williams. And then my team and I got um, unanimously reelected for a second term. And then I figured I'd done enough damage in El Paso County. I decided to take my show on the road and, uh, uh, you know, I had a good good contest for the state party chairmanship. So I don't know, just keep keep stumbling forward. That's all I've tried to do. But I really do enjoy it, you know, and I, I take some of my military background and it's the, the mission of the services 
is to organize, train, and equip. And I really do look at that as an analogy for the parties. The party's job is to build the infrastructure that allows our candidates to succeed, is to organize, train, equip, recruit, develop, um, you know, build that ground game, build that infrastructure, and, uh, you know, let it loose so our candidates can march to victory. I love that. It's a great segue. I'm going to actually change up the question. I'll come back to uh, tax reform and and our opportunity to kind of spike the football in the end zone. I'm going to beat you to your sports analogy there. (laughs) Um, You you kind of came in in the middle of a competitive U.S. Senate race, um, a challenging primary on the Republican side Mm -hmm. where Daryl Glenn ultimately emerged to take on our current U.S. Senator Michael Bennett. What did you learn from that that you can take forward? Um, What do you build on as you move into some very competitive races here in 2018? Well, I had the pleasure of being involved in El Paso County as a chairman for Corey Gardner's successful race, and I also saw Daryl Glenn's race. And obviously, Daryl being a hometown guy from El Paso County, in fact, he's my county commissioner here on the north end of town. Uh, we were very much engaged trying to, trying to carry Daryl across the finish line. I thought, um, you know, if you juxtapose, you run the risk of criticizing one over the other. I thought Corey did a great job in raising money to build a ground game, have professional walkers who organized the teams of volunteers. Uh, he raised a lot of money, very charismatic, and was not afraid to tack a little bit more toward the middle, recognizing that in a purple state, you can't, um, you really can't be as far right maybe as you would like to be. I don't think Daryl ever really came from that position uh, a little bit more toward the middle. He didn't raise the money. We never really had the ground game development outside of the RNC infrastructure. So, um, you know, I've seen both sides of it, and I thought Darrell was a very dynamic speaker, dynamic candidate. Uh, We just didn't quite get it done in that election. We can't, frankly, afford to do that in, in another two years when we have those kind of opportunities. And it goes into the governor's race as well. We have some strategic advantages over the Democrats right now. Our ground game capability, our data systems are so much better than theirs. I think we've seen a lot of positive things happen, like with tax reform, that's going to impact every American, every Coloradan, whether you're Democrat, Independent, or Republican. So I think it's going to give us a strategic advantage to get to cut through all the silliness and the messaging that's taking place on both sides and really cut to the core issue. When people have more money to feed their kids and send their kids off to school and take care of their families, and we can point to a Republican Congress and a Republican president for driving and completing that agenda, that's a winner for us. And when we can go out there and use this, frankly, awesome data system we have and the tools that we have for the ground game to drive voter turnout, I think we've got a great chance of winning. And so that's what I'm focused on. Well, you referenced the tax reform, and certainly that was going to be where I was heading that and also the national narrative. I, tax reform certainly was an opportunity to really celebrate uh, the ability to, again, provide some relief for working Coloradoans and for uh, business owners of all shapes and sizes, not only in our state but across this country, uh, to start to regain a little bit of that competitive advantage uh, that we have been uh, so tampered and beaten down and hampered by over the years uh, when you look at our corporate tax rate compared to so many others. There's also a narrative going on in D.C. right now and and a lot of discussion about what that impact may mean. There's certainly been a, a, a lot of studies over the course of history about party and president in power and what happens to his party in the next off year election coming into 2018, the chance to lose seats. Where are you at with that? How do you think President Trump helps or hurts you and your party and your efforts here in Colorado? Well, just like when you invest, you get a portfolio that says past performance does not necessarily indicate future success. And the same thing is true with disaster. You know, there is a thought that Uh, In the off-year election, the president loses seats in Congress. That doesn't necessarily have to happen. I understand why it does happen, because Americans are always leery of giving any group too much authority. And if they perceive that the Republicans are abusing their authority, I think that they should rightfully uh, stick us in the eye a little bit. But I'll tell you what, if we're doing a good job, and I think we are nationally, we're not getting everything done we want to accomplish, but we are deregulating this economy we are deregulating our society. Uh, Donald Trump is turning out to be quite a federalist in terms of allowing the states to do what they're supposed to do. And hopefully our state will allow our counties and individuals to 
exercise proper authority. Um, and so, you know, we've had tremendous successes in trying to reform the VA. That's a very sensitive issue for a lot of people, frankly, in El Paso County, but really across the state because we do have a large number of veterans. And then the economic boost. I mean, so many people have investments in 401Ks and IRAs and individual stocks, and that cuts across. That's not just for the rich. That's everybody that's pretty much got a retirement program. They're seeing their retirement program get a tremendous boost with the stock market going up. They're going to see more money in their in their paychecks at the end of the day. They're going to see businesses investing in opportunities. So we're going to get people off the unemployment rolls and onto the payrolls. So uh, if we can't win with that, good grief. <laughs> <laughs> and if the people of if the people of Colorado don't respond to that, then you know, frankly, we get the government we deserve because the other side they voted unanimously against giving people their money back and it is our money government's uh you know certainly taking it ideally for legitimate aims but it's our money and no democrat voted to give you your money back and i think that's a key message we need to keep promulgating when you look at the uh, couple of bills that were passed last year 107 108 um, under that kind of the mm-hmm. bucket of let colorado vote i i had an editorial that was ran that really i think talked a little bit about messaging and I think some of the Republican shortfalls in addressing uh, millennials and minorities, independents, and that outreach and messaging. What do you take and how are you using 107-108 to prepare to address those issues and the potential of of new voters um, entering into the Republican Party and casting votes? How do you message that? How are you trying to make that a win for you and the party? Well, there's a stepwise process, Jeff. You have to identify voters. you got to figure out who is slayable, you know, because there's some people that are hard on our side, hard on the other side. And those folks on, on either end, they're very difficult to persuade. But there is a large body, and it's not just unaffiliated. It's, it's even, you know, Democrats and Republicans, depending on the issue. So the, the key is to go out there armed with your data tools and your data system and your volunteer base that's trained and well-equipped and go out there and talk to people, engage them in conversations. And so... The inclusion of unaffiliated voters who are now the largest voting bloc in Colorado in our primary is a great opportunity for me. I don't, I never viewed this as an existential threat. I, uh, I certainly spoke out against it early on, but once the voters approved it and a lot of Republicans voted for it, uh, we gave the Central Committee the opportunity to vote on it as uh, the law prescribes. And our central committee voted overwhelmingly to include unaffiliated voters in the primary. So <clears throat> we're, we're allowing our candidates that are on the board right now in a very unbiased, agnostic sort of way to use our data systems, to go knock on those unaffiliated voters' door and to try to find out who can be swayed and start recruiting those folks. So we're really leaving it up to our candidates right now to figure out how to exploit the, the tools and also the opportunity. So we're embracing it. And, um, you know, I think it. Not every not every unaffiliated voter is going to be swayed to be a Republican. That's I think a characteristic of the state of Colorado, and that's why we're trying hard to keep Colorado Colorado. We respect the independent spirit, and we respect the unwillingness to be labeled by a lot of Coloradans. But we want those folks to vote for us because we do feel like we are driving an agenda that benefits them more. Um, frequently, more positively, and more greatly than the other side does. And so I hope that's not too rambling of an answer. No, it's a great answer, and I appreciate that. One of the things that I think as you look historically here in Colorado, the Republicans seem to have very robust, uh, challenging primaries, and there uh, has been a Democrat candidate. They were, there's a party coalescing behind a candidate much earlier um, we get involved in spending a lot more funds and resources and providing sound bites this year uh, the democrats have in- several incredibly challenging primaries um, how do you see that playing into some of these races uh, that they're going to be having kind of that uh, fulfilled primary races in addition to the republicans Well, I think the Democrats certainly have had to respond to not just allegations, but the overwhelming evidence that their primary at the national level was rigged. Uh, You had people putting their thumb on the scales on both sides, and and it created a lot of resentment on their side. I think also the the anger and the frustration with the 
kicking that they've received nationally. You know, not so much in Colorado because obviously we're we're very split as a state. But if you look at the national state legislatures and the national governorships, national county commissionerships, we are we are dominating in that area. And I think it's because not only our message but also our results are resonating with you know your average American on the street grassroots type folks. Um, but also the frustration in losing the momentum that they had built up during the Obama era and driving that leftist agenda, I think it's stimulating a lot more of their people to get involved. Now, that's good for us because it forces them to clarify their positions before they get involved in the general election. And so just just like sometimes we have to do, our candidates sometimes will have to run pretty far to the right to get the Republican electorate to vote for them. Now we're going to force them to play their hands a little bit earlier and spend some money and clarify their positions and reveal themselves a little bit more. So I really think it's probably long term good for the Democrats to do that, but it's definitely good for us. And I think it's better for the state of Colorado uh, not having a chosen shadow candidate essentially uh, be propped up in a position where they don't really have to tell you what they're about until they get elected. So I think it's positive. Uh, when you look across the state, I mean, your role as the party chair, you're dealing with a uh, congressional delegation and, and several candidates in some competitive races. Uh, Ken Buck certainly has a primary this year. Uh, mm-hmm. Corey, uh, you look at Kaufman having a primary with Roger Edwards, uh, Lamborn having, I think, two or three candidates mm-hmm. now opposing him in the primary. What races do you see as pivotal for the Republicans to hold at the congressional level? And then how do you uh, line up with the House and Senate and and controlling and keeping the Senate and Republicans' hands and trying to take over uh, the House here in Colorado? Well, let me preface it by saying I am committed to being agnostic and unbiased in the primary. So I don't want anybody to misconstrue anything I say. Congressional District 6 is one that we've got to hold on to. You know, currently Mike Coffin's there. It's very difficult to outwork Mike. Um, you know, a lot of people think he does a great job, but obviously there's a, some sentiment that he needs to be primaried, and uh, we're providing support to, to all our candidates. <clears throat> That's the hard one. That's the one that we really have to work very hard to win. Um, we are more secure. We know a Republican's going to win in CD5 uh, down here in El Paso County. Certainly Doug Lamborn has got some formidable challengers. He's faced those kind of things before. But, um, you know, there seems to be enthusiasm across the board down there. And uh, Ken Buck as well. You know, a lot of people are very um, fervent, fervent Ken Buck fans. And um, but obviously he's, he's got an opponent there as well. We feel like we're going to win that seat as well. Uh, there's some others. You know, if we had the right candidate in CD7, I think we'd have a chance. We're still milling around trying to find somebody to run there uh, because I think um, – Mr. Perlmutter has shown his lack of enthusiasm for his current job. He made a, a dalliance with running for governor and talked about not having the, the you know fire in the belly anymore. And I think you look at his record, it's really not one of great productivity for the people of that district or for the people of Colorado either. So, you know, we've got an opportunity there if we can strike. Uh, the other ones are more difficult at the congressional level. Um, statewide, we do have... Uh, really an unbelievable mix of candidates at the gubernatorial level. We've got some really talented, good people. And the voters of Colorado are going to have a tough choice because these guys are working hard, they're running good campaigns, and they all really are standing for good things in varying degrees. So I think people do have a tough choice, and it's kind of an embarrassment of riches for us. Uh, Wayne Williams has done a great job as Secretary of State. <clears throat> He's got popular support on both sides. I think if Wayne, you know, runs a decent campaign, we're going to win that seat despite what the other side raises. I think George Brockler is an outstanding candidate. Anybody that's ever heard him speak knows not only how affable and great on the stump he is, I mean, he's just a really enjoyable person to be around. But he's extremely competent as well, and he's had a, you know, an unbelievable lifetime of service to our country. So I think we've got a great shot and hold on to those. We've got some good treasurer candidates as well. And so those three positions statewide that we have right now, uh, I think we've got a really good shot of holding on to them. We've got a couple of key Senate races that we're going to focus on, and our candidates are already working hard in those areas because we've got to hold on to the Senate. Otherwise, we run the risk of turning ourselves uh, into California or maybe even worse, into Boulder. And so uh, we just cannot let that happen. So we're going to focus on the Senate as well. And, 
you know, maybe we'll pick up a few seats in the house and flip that as well. It's, um, you know, we're going to work like we've got a chance. So to that end, what what would uh, success or disappointment look like in November for you on election night? Well, wild success means we win the governor's race. We win all the statewide races. We flip the House and we hold on to the Senate. That's unbelievable success. And we continue to you know, maintain and increase our presence at the county level as well, county sheriff, county commissioner levels. You know, there's some really key races at those levels that need to be won. That's success. And it's not just success in the Ford versus Chevy, Republicans versus Democrat competitive aspect, but we feel like we've got better ideas, and we feel like our ideas are going to benefit a greater number of, of Coloradans. So I think if we succeed, Colorado succeeds. Now, failure means that we don't win the governor's race and we lose you know, one of those key races like sec- Secretary of State or the uh, Attorney General, and we lose the Senate. That's, that's failure. And it's failure for the people of Colorado because we saw back when the Democrats had the House and the Senate and the governorship, they jammed through stuff like these ridiculous mandates on clean power that impacted rural Coloradans asymmetrically. We got magazine limits. We got a crummy voter system that has unbelievably loosey-goosey voter ID requirements. Um, You know, they just they didn't do a lot of positive things when they had it all. And so that's a. I think it's a somewhat dangerous situation for the pocketbooks and the freedom of people in Colorado. Jeff, I want to go back to something you mentioned earlier. Um, I think it was pretty widely known in the state of Colorado that the Democrats had a, a vastly superior ground game and a data uh, system. Um, you claim today now um, that certainly the Republicans have a vastly superior system. What change was it really the investment, the strategy, a combination of both? Uh, a complete change in the, the types of equipment, hardware, software that the party's using now? It was the investment. You know, the Republican Party at the national level spent probably $175 million on acquiring, refining, developing a, a data system, and also hiring the bright minds that were able to dig into it and perform those uh, analytical processes that. You know, it's one thing to take data and look back and see what happened. That's somewhat useful, but it's more important to do probability. It's like the difference between probability and statistics. So you got to be able to project. <clears throat> and so we have a, a really good set of modeling tools. We have appropriate information in there that allows us to model voter behavior. And so, um, you know, it's not, a, it's not a secret. We're really good at it. And we need to continue to enhance it, to continue to develop it, to continue to support it. And, um, you know, I feel like it's a strategic advantage we have right now because uh, in this kind of data arms race, you cannot be static. you got to keep moving forward. Otherwise, you know, the Democrats always have a bunch of donors. They'll throw a bunch of money at it. They've got social media on their side. Everybody knows how biased Google and Facebook and other, uh, these other data mining uh, elements are. Um, they'll continue to try to strive and improve. They, they were wounded very deeply by this last election. They do have a lot of intensity and passion and, and resentment about what happened. And so they're going to they're gonna channel that anger and trying to get better. And, and they know the problem that the Democrats have is that they've got, they've got the Bernie faction. They've got the Clinton faction. They've got the Obama faction. And then they've got the RNT infrastructure, and they're going at each other. We don't really have that equivalent. We've got a pretty unified effort, especially for Republicans. Uh, the RNC is doing a phenomenal job, and we feel like we're doing a good job at the state level as well. We've got less than a minute here, but I do want to ask very quick. We've spent a lot of time on candidates in the election uh, in 2018. What is the party's role? What is your role on some of the issues facing Colorado, attainable housing, transportation, education? How do you as a party weigh in on those issues? You know, we typically stay out of policy. That's why you elect legislators. That's why you elect county commissioners to do those kind of things. We're, we try to support them to the maximum extent possible. Uh, if there's any way that we can help them using our communications infrastructure to drive that infra- or to drive that agenda, excuse me, we will do that. But I don't get involved in those kind of things, to be honest with you. I certainly have my individual opinions as an American and Coloradan and Republican, but. Um, you know, I applaud our legislators. They're trying to solve some problems and prioritize things like transportation and, you know, rural, um, 
internet infrastructure and, and support, those kind of things. And they're prioritizing, unlike the Democrats who don't want to prioritize anything, they just want more money. They want more tax dollars. And our guys are trying to make sense out of the things that matter and legitimate government. So we support them wholeheartedly. Um, Leader Neville and Senator Grantham, you know, I've got good relationships with them. And I know that uh, they know that we can they can count on us to help them in any way possible because I know they're fighting for the rights of Coloradans. Wonderful. Thanks, Thank Jeff. You. Thank you so much, Jeff Hayes, for joining us here on Connect and Collaborate. We hope you have a wonderful day and that your legislative session goes very well for you. Thanks well, for thank you very us, much. Jeff. I appreciate you guys. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye. Bye-bye. And welcome to Connect and Collaborate. My name is Alex Hopkins. I am taking over for Tammy Schaefer, your regular on-air producer. And today we are talking about the legislative preview, right? We heard from the Senate. Now we're going to hear from the House of Representatives. And we have Representative Lori Sain here. She is with the Republican House of Representatives. And we have Jeff Wozden to kick off this conversation because my political knowledge is pretty poor so we're gonna get some <laughs> questions out with Jeff. Does anybody actually know what goes on there Representative Sane? We don't either. Just, I was gonna say you probably fit in with a bunch of us. Don't, don't feel bad. Of Colorado sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Well, Laura, let's jump in real quick. Uh, let's chat a little bit and just so our listeners are aware of what district you represent, how long you served in the state legislature. Okay. Well, the district I represent is House District 63, which is the majority of Weld County, which is about 4,000 4, square miles, one of our original counties in Colorado. So I border Wyoming, I border Larimer County, Morgan County, Adams County, and Boulder and Broomfield County. <laughs> And what uh, committees are you assigned to uh, this year? Agricultural and natural resources, which, given that we have all the water and all the oil and gas. Yeah, so those are pretty good. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's fitting. Yeah. Right that's someone, someone did good there. <laughs> <laughs> and you were uh, are in House leadership um, yes. in the Minority Caucus. Talk a little bit about that position, how long you've been in leadership, and what that like uh, is serving in that capacity. Well, the first thing I had to get used to is being called Madam. Yes. I've never been a madam before, but it's Madam Caucus Chair. Madam and caucus so I do run chair. the House Caucus meetings and keep everybody in line and in order during those meetings. So and that's possible? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, sometimes. I know who you <laughs> work with down there. <laughs> Let's be honest now. You don't have to name names. But of, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we do have a timeout room now. <laughs> but, uh, but I also organize uh, a lot of the functions, a lot of the learning functions. Um, some of the things are going to be coming up uh, this year, in fact, will be having a lot of caucus lunches um, and other lunch and learns events so we can unpack some of these issues. Uh, transportation is probably one of the easier ones. If you ever sat on I-25 and looked at, you know, the accident in front of you, which is one a day, it's mostly a combat zone anytime you try to get to work. Um, that's really putting a lot of those neg negative externalities on the regular person, the taxpayer that's spending their time in traffic rather than spending it with their family. And there's other things that are harder to unpack, like some of these transparency issues issues around um, health care and particularly medicine. And so there's going to be seven bills on uh, this, this idea that uh, some of these larger corporations are really sticking it to the little guy mm -hmm. on raising prices. And we're going to unpack some of those ideas to see what's true and what isn't. You were elected to a two-year term, um, and so we're in the uh, finished the first of those two years. So I want to just take a quick snapshot, a look back at, to last year. Uh, any accomplishments that you personally were very happy about, uh, proud of, and anything that, that kind of a regret that you didn't quite get over the finish line before uh, the session ended last year? Well, last year was definitely the year for affordable housing. Um, yeah. The construction defect bill I'd been working on, especially with members of my community last three or four years, uh, delving into some of their concerns and some of their issues. Uh, last last session, almost every night was construction defects night. Wow. And I actually remember sending something to the drafter at 10 p.m. on a Friday night saying, well, I don't always work construction defects, but if I do, it's on a Friday. <laughs> <laughs> well, well but, played. <laughs> but, uh, but that's such an important issue. If you've noticed that our new state bird is the crane, you know, in Denver here. <laughs> we um, love that. It, that bill, <laughs> along with a Supreme Court decision, is really making some headway on making sure we can build more, to, yes, and, and build more to that affordable housing. But one of the most significant impacts will be for everyone, regardless if you're in a single-family home or not. This is the first time you will get a vote 
on your most important asset. You will actually get a cost, something uh, akin to a cost-benefit analysis to say, you know, if we go through this lawsuit, we'll actually fix the defect. I mean, that's really the point, right, is will you receive enough money to fix the defect? And now they're going to receive information about how much they may have to pay, especially if they lose. Um, their assessments may go up. Um, if it will, you know, indeed maybe cover that defect that they're looking to fix. And that way we're avoiding these uh, frivolous lawsuits without, it's tort reform without tort reform. But, but now we can actually have, for the first time, they can hear from both parties. They can hear from the builders, and they can also hear from the lawyers, the trial lawyers. And so often the builders um, have wanted the opportunity and have made that offer to fix the defect because they want to keep their folks happy and make sure that they're whole, especially because their products are so proud of it. But they haven't had that opportunity before. And so if we can go ahead and get the defect fixed without going to court, that's better for everyone. Absolutely. Yes. Such a major accomplishment, something that the business community has been working with the legislature for years and, and, and something we should all be proud of because it's yeah. really getting into attainable, affordable worker yeah. housing, the diversity of housing options in this state. Anything that you were disappointed personally, a bill that you were trying to carry or that you and your, your Republican House caucus just couldn't quite get done? regulatory reform yes, or others. <laughs> like sort of head there, but yes. Uh, as far as my bills, I got almost everything I wanted done last year, which Good. is an amazing thing. But yeah. um, uh, yes, regulatory reform is something we need to tackle this year, especially in light of everything that's happening nationwide with the, with the Trump administration. Well and people, when they get more money in their pockets come up in, you know, uh, next month in, in March, they're going to say, wow, you know, the Republican um, ideas are working for me and my family. Um, and businesses are expanding. That confidence level is very high. So we need to follow suit here in Colorado. And the, unfortunately, the, the message I, I think I heard from the speaker is, let's make Colorado more affordable by you paying more. Okay, that doesn't make sense. We need to prioritize um, what we do with our budget, just like you do at the kitchen table. And you look for, this is, these are things we'd like to have, but this is the priority right now. And one of the main disappointments from last session is transportation. Yeah. I know. Well, I started my day yesterday with a transportation meeting and certainly have another convening tomorrow. Uh, transportation is going to be a hot topic. Before we get into your role as Madam Caucus Chair, um, what are you looking at personally, Representative Lori, saying for you that type of bills or legislation you'd like to get accomplished in the 2018 session? Well, this year I'm probably going to be working on a lot more of the housekeeping issues. They're they're important things, but you know they're things that need to be get to you know get done. They may not be uh, receive a lot of attention this year. One of the things I've been working on is the the 811. Um, you know, maybe increasing, uh, making that more robust that system so that we don't have as many line strikes to begin with. Mm -hmm. So we can avoid obviously what happened in the Firestone area, which is where I live. Um, and, and then maybe taking part of uh, that issue and, and helping homeowners um, realize that, you know, they, they do need to also call 811 and maybe find out what's around them as well. Yeah. Um, so we, that's things we've been working with at the industry over the past, um, well, since last March. Um, a lot of the ideas that the governor's office and I have talked about have already been implemented uh, with some of the rulemaking processes, which I'm very happy about. If we can do that before a session happens, that's fantastic. So a lot of those things, especially checking before we even turn on a well, you know, and making sure all the lines are checked, uh, will probably help. What is one the one uh, number one issues that'll help resolve, uh, making sure that never happens again. And that's really the focus to make sure that never happens to anybody else again. Good. So moving into your role now in leadership, um, we know that there are several issues that this uh, legislative body is going to be facing this year. You mentioned oil, gas. Uh, certainly there's mm. uh, changes to the way Colorado budgets that have been talked about. Mm. You've got increased revenue and how that's going to be fought or divided up. Para reform. You mentioned the health care transparency, this growing urban divide. I love the crane as our new state bird, I but <laughs> there is a... Cory Gardner said it first. There yeah. is an anti-growth <laughs> movement that's certainly afoot out there and one of those things that, that may happen at the state level, but certainly it's happening across local yeah. jurisdictions here in the state of Colorado, the opioid crisis, mm -hmm. um, well, we certainly talked about roads and transportation. What is it that you and your caucus are going to be most focused on of that growing list or others that I didn't mention? 
Well, back to some of the things we did accomplish last year. I mean, the construction defects bill will certainly help. If people can um, actually live where they work, that's going to reduce some congestion. But we have to go much further than that. Back to the prioritization of our budget. We need to prioritize infrastructure this year. We need to prioritize roads because some of the anti-growth sentiment is coming um, from this presence on the roads where you're spending an extra half an hour. When you're so stressed by the time you get to work or get home because it's 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 basically a combat zone out there where you have to avoid these other drivers. Mm -hmm. And they're so frustrated. I see an accident every day when I go to work now. That didn't used to be the case six years ago. So this is something we've got to tackle and we've got to do. One of the things that we suggested as a House caucus is to make sure that people who have a certain core competency, they've come from all different backgrounds, these legislators, and they sit on these committees of reference. Why don't we make that the figure setting committees that is then referred to the JBC so we can tap into the wisdom of some of these amazing individuals that serve in the Colorado legislature? So with the increased revenue, um, when you talk about that prioritization that is so critical, there's certainly some needs in, in infrastructure and that we're very supportive of the bonding procedures and, and ability to leverage today's dollars and advance some of those projects. Education, this yeah. growing urban-rural divide. What else is out there? What's pulling and tugging? Who's trying to get their hands on that money? <laughs> <laughs> well, we are, we are facing a, tr a traditional divide where one party wants to invest in infrastructure and the other one wants to invest in social services. But I would submit to you, um, you know, whose household budget has grown 45 percent in the last 10 years? Well, our, our state budget has certainly grown more than that in the last 10 years, and certainly some of the uh, monies we're spending for education has increased maybe up to 45% in the last 10 years. Same with Medicare, went from $3 billion to $9 billion, a 300% increase in the past decade. Something is wrong there, and we need to make sure we're prioritizing that money so that truly the needy, the disabled can receive that money versus a lot of the folks who are able-bodied and can work in receiving those Medicaid dollars. Our state treasurer, uh, Walker Stapleton, has been a proposal. Uh, certainly Walker's looking at that. There's different ideas. Again, that's yes. part of the uh, fund for impair our public employee retirement system mm -hmm. that we have here in the state of Colorado. Yes. Uh, the governor's of the legislative <laughs> body and the process we have. Uh, how do you look at that issue and how do we ensure that promises made or promises kept? That's a great question. And one of the first speeches I watched uh, Walker give about 10 years ago, he said it's not a Democrat problem, it's not a Republican problem, it's a math problem. And ra math problems need to be solved. He's absolutely correct. And when you ta hear the governor talk about shared sacrifices, you know, I think about the bread lines in the Soviet Union. You know, we don't all need to share the sacrifice. Uh, public employees like myself who receive para, um, we should have that sacrifice. We have a better pension program than many in the private sector. We need to look at home first to what costs we can cut. It's also a disservice for people coming into public service because a lot of those young folks, you know, maybe they're looking to build a resume and they're only there for two years, but they don't get vested, right? right. And they can't move that retirement plan to another retirement plan. And uh, in addition to that, by the way, legislators aren't treated the same either. You can choose between um, the defined benefit and the defined contribution. It should be all one and the same. And when it comes to sacrifice, we should sacrifice here first. When you look at the growing urban-rural divide, the two economies in Colorado between the Front Range and certainly as you move out to the Slope and Eastern yeah. Plains, um, certainly broadband, uh, rural broadband's been brought up a lot. What are the other challenges? Are there ideas that are floating out there that you think have some merit of how we continue to ensure that all Coloradans from yeah. corner to corner um, have access to quality education, access to, mm -hmm. to broadband, to services, yeah. ability to put foods on the table? And I think broadband is a, a part of that infrastructure and it may be the key to the new education model so we can make sure everyone gets the same opportunity, especially in, in rural areas. So I think that's, a, that's an important component as well. Um, what was the other part of the question again? Just the, the economies and oh, the economic yeah. development that certainly JJ and the Metro Denver EDC and the yeah. Front Range are experiencing versus right. other areas of the state that aren't experiencing that same robust growth. Well, interesting enough, there was a bill that was passed last session, which is 267. Um, that was the subject of a special session. Not a lot got done. But part of that bill is very valuable to all of us, and that is um, all these departments were required to submit a 2% decrease. Right. If they were to submit a 2% decrease back to the prioritization, 
we haven't seen that yet. That's that's part of the transparency issue we're dealing with. We've asked the governor's office to show us this. I mean, back to the sacrifice should start at home first. You know, we should take a look at what we're prioritizing. There's a lot of things that are nice to have, but we don't need to have right now. We do need to have transportation. We do need to have education. We do need to have broadband. You mentioned the governor. Um, this is his last year. Mm -hmm. um, this is also an election year. Yes. Uh, for those listeners that may not understand, talk a little bit about the dynamics of election year politics at the state capitol, yeah. uh, signature bills, putting people on record, and how that may impact your optimism, uh, the ability to get some of these things done. Well, I think I'm very op optimistic this year, more so than other election years, because the success of what we've seen with the Trump administration with the tax cuts and some of the ideas that are coming out there, really anybody's chasing that success right now. So I think that's important to say if, if somebody's trying to leave a legacy, they should really be focusing on making sure that government is as most efficient as it possibly can be, making sure Colorado is affordable to Coloradans and to businesses that are looking to come in here. And that starts at home by prioritizing the budget and going back to what needs to be addressed immediately. And I'm very hopeful that we're gonna get something done on transportation this year. We've got nearly a billion dollars more this year than we did last year. And I hate to say that out loud because people rush to spend that as fast as they can, but we <laughs> back to the prioritization. <laughs> we need to make sure transportation is priority number one this year. There, there's not a line for that money, is there really? <laughs> <laughs> I'm shocked. I'm really sh <laughs> when, when we look at the national narrative <laughs> and, and what's happening with this current administration. You've mentioned a few things in, uh, yeah. on air and off air with tax reform and regulatory rollbacks. Yes. How does the, the national politics and that narrative impact maybe what goes on at the Capitol? How do you build upon those things? Mm -hmm. um, how do you play offense and defense with, with what's happening nationally? Well, I think the House Republicans are going to strike a, a lot more positive attitude this year about things we can do especially with all the opportunities that were given to us this year. And a lot of the regulations we've seen at the national level have been quietly rolled back, but they're having a huge impact right now. The confidence level has never been higher for some, some business owners out there. And I wanna make sure that we are not um, demonizing uh, what the Democrats call the 1% because that 1% is your neighbor. It is your neighbor who has a small business who employs maybe up to 50 people and, and making sure that, that that business has the best chance to succeed as possible in Colorado because that provides opportunity. That provides jobs, especially people coming from elsewhere that are looking that, for that opportunity to get out of abject poverty and raise the standard of living for their family. A couple of things that are certainly making the rounds nationally right now, and, and you mentioned Cory Gardner coining the, the uh, national or the state bird. Uh, <laughs> he, he had a meeting with uh, Sessions on marijuana. Um, certainly the state has gone through yeah. that. You're seeing now California and other states coming on board. Uh, where are we at with that in this state? Are there yeah. going to be new re uh, regulation? And, and I'm couching that with this idea that I've been yeah. kicking around with a few people from our standpoint. Mm -hmm. Is the need for medicinal marijuana still there? To me, you've got 18-year-olds, this mm -hmm. farm club, because recreational starts at 21. Right. You also have the taxing issue that people can circumvent paying the taxes that are on the recreational through the mm -hmm. medicinal. Do we still need medicinal? What changes do you see in the marijuana landscape? Well, that is such Boy, a huge... I put that out on record, didn't I? Yeah, did. Oh, yeah, yeah. Wax <laughs> on that one. We might need two shows to discuss everything that may be going you know, on in the next few years. The views expressed do not represent the Colorado... <laughs> no, wait, it is us. They Never do. mind. They do. They do. <laughs> so um, there's going to be some tension, obviously. There's tension not only within our state, but also nationally with uh, uh, Mr. Sessions deciding, you know, maybe we'll roll back certain protections. So I think everybody's going to be a little on edge to see what happens there. I think there may be a push for banking for marijuana companies. Um, that seems to make sense based on, you know, a couple different, you know, variables. But um, on, on medical marijuana, I, I've talked to people in my district. I do, you know, knock doors, if it's election year or not. And one of the things I've noticed that people have moved here from other states, they've had children who had seizures and now are using a product called Charlotte's Web that seems to be very difficult to, to ship to other states based on you know the, the national enforcement. So they've come here and those seizures have reduced from 100 an hour to maybe one or two. 
positive benefits. Have, right. Yeah. So obviously there's there's a need. I mean, it's there, there's there's things that there are some modern miracles that have come out of this industry, but there's also some modern headaches. Um, we have a lot of pushback from local government saying not here because you do have increased crime, you have increased um, our drug driving um, that happens around those facilities that people have experienced. There are certain towns that um, in Weld County that uh, had said yes to medical marijuana and had so many troubles, especially with getting enforcement help, they decided to put a moratorium on it. So we've actually had some towns try it and say, we can't afford it. Uh, immigration certainly would be another one. The business roundtable has been front and center on this particular issue. Mm -hmm. um, there was an interesting meeting that happened in the White House with cameras rolling. I think it provided some great opportunity for yeah. the casual public uh, that may not yeah. be as engaged as you and other politicos are mm -hmm. to actually see how these things are sat down and hashed out and um, how you try and get to consensus and something that will get to yes. Uh, yeah. It's a critical economic issue for the roundtable with yeah. DACA and the Dreamers and yeah. others. I, right. Is there going to be anything that you see in this session that, that's going to address that or are we uh, just really relying on our national uh, legislative body and the president to handle that issue? If I had to take my magic eight ball, I would say um, it's probably going to be more of a national focus. Okay. Um, we may have a bill here and there, but I think the focus is going to be seeing what the Trump administration is going to do on DACA in particular and, you know, what, if any, enforcement mechanisms or walls are going to be coming. Education workforce. Certainly there were a couple of years where that seemed to be the uh, the signature amount of bills that were done in a yes. package in 2015-16-ish. Uh -huh. um, are we where you and your caucus would like to be on the, on those two issues, the right kind of funding, the no. transparency, the, the returns, and getting the workforce, the, the candidates that we need to move business forward? Right. The and answer is no. I'm guessing yeah. we know where you are. So. No, no. There's, there's a lot of things we could be doing, and the focus seems to be, or the measure of success for a lot of high schools seems to be you need to go to college. You need to get that four-year degree, and there's so many other options available, and part of the American dream, I mean, I'm, I see oil workers every day making 80000 plus, and they didn't go to college, and it's a blue-collar family, you know, making those one percenters, again, my gosh, you know, 80,000 to 120,000 out in the oil fields. It's tough work, but uh, they're making a living for their, themselves, their family, and they're reinvesting that money into the economy. So we do need to have more of those programs, you know, you know, for welders, uh, for people doing automotive repair. There's so many gaps right now in the skills market. We're having to import those people, those anti-growth people that are coming in, and then can't find housing still because we're still lagging behind, um, and then leave the state. We saw an article where people are very frustrated. They've come here, and it's so unaffordable for the average person coming into Colorado nowadays. It's a huge barrier to entry, not only to workers, but also the companies. Yeah, we're hosting a uh, education business coalition on this particular issue. Uh, yeah. We need to ensure that all Coloradans, yeah. all of our youth, yeah. have that opportunity to a meaningful career, yeah. uh, to the kind of education that they need to be successful, whatever that pathway. And, and we're with you on that representative saying that there are multiple pathways. Let's make sure that all kids have access, the right. ability to be successful. Last thing I'll throw at you uh, as our time winds down here, the opioid crisis, mental health mm -hmm. issues. Talk a little bit about that and where this state is and what we can do on those two issues. That's a tough and, and thorny issue. We had a very good um, uh, legislative panel this past interim discussing some of those solutions. I haven't had a chance to review all of them, but it's definitely going to be one of our topics that we're going to be um, learning about this session. Uh, whatever we can do to stem this, to, to help um, uh, these individuals make sure they get back on the path uh, of dignity and the dignity of returning to work and not being ostracized by family or, I mean, whatever we can do to help. But um, I'm not sure I have the answer to that as far as um, how do we how do we just how do we just stop people from being addicted? There's a lot of things that um, go into that with mental health, like you just mentioned. It's like the chicken and the egg. Where do you start on some of these issues? Um, it's going to be hard to stop access because as soon as you restrict certain things, the black market explodes. And then you have other problems besides that. We just had a guest on last week talking about transparency in the healthcare industry. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned seven bills going on. He was referencing one of those seven. Uh, yes. um, how do you guys, just through the process, right? We understand that's important that it could have 
significant impacts to consumers to understand what they're paying, where they're paying, and level that. Um, but how do you create the seven bills and get that into something that actually works, right? Walk us through that process in this last minute of coming up with the right bill that actually works. Take your time. <laughs> <laughs> She'll let me out later. Don't worry. Well, on those seven bills, let's go back to her magic eight ball and shake it and then, you know, see what sticks against the wall. And I swear there's some legislators that, that may do that. They just say, well, let's just stick, see if it sticks against the wall and see if it gets signed in the law. But what you should do is you should have a robust stakeholder process and, and ask the people who are actually in the industry. You should ask the people that have to deal with the, the certain um, uh, different businesses within that industry or uh, if there's middlemen or suppliers or, you know, just get a robust um, uh, stakeholder process. And you should really start that the year before. This is making way too much sense. I, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, if, if you're trying to start a bill in the middle of session, it's probably not going to work really well. But um, I, I've been hearing there has not been a robust stakeholder process uh, in, in, in regards to transparency on that issue. Of how we bring those, and I love that, right? Sit yeah. down together, talk about the various bills, and come up with the one that actually has some merit that we can get to the right. governor's desk. And it's not sign. a silver bullet to start the year before, but it sure helps. <laughs> love Absolutely. That. Thank you so much, <laughs> Representative Lori Sane, or as you love to be called, Madam Caucus no. Chair. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Love this that. has been very informative, <laughs> and uh, we will see you tomorrow here on Connecting collaborate. Thank you. All right.